Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. Well, everything was different this Christmas, and yet everything was the same. The truth that Jesus Christ came into the world, Emmanuel, and that's what we've been celebrating and will continue to do so. I know it's January, but January is the darkest of months. We need all the light we can get. And so our praise today will still very much have a Christmas ring to it. I want to thank everybody who has contributed to this worship service today so willingly and ably. Thank you to them. And most of all, thanks be to God for the gift of Christ. Let us then worship God together. Once in royal David's city stood a lonely cattle shed where a mother laid her baby in a major royal bed. Mary was that mother. Eternal and loving God, as the calendars change and the days move on, you are with us, unchanging, timeless. As we look ahead to the year to come and the path seems foggy, you are with us, guiding the way, shining your light that overpowers all darkness. We can be certain that you will never leave us. Father, you created us to be in perfect, trusting relationship with you. Your son, Jesus Christ, has entered the world for us. And we can be sure as we walk, your spirit guides us and is with us. We are, Father, totally wrapped up in your love and care. Yet we confess that sometimes we still choose to turn away. There are times when we try to take control of our lives and we close our eyes to 
the safe paths that you have prepared for us to walk. We ask your forgiveness and our trust returns. You turn us back towards the star that guides our way. We are provided certainty that this forgiveness will be given through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, we trust in your promises, for they are eternal. When we cannot be sure of what the next day or minute or hour will bring, still we can be sure of you. And let the peace that that ultimate trust brings fill our hearts as we step forward into a new year. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Martin's Memorial Church of Scotland in Stornoway. Martin Hrialagus Falte Hainel Hrialagus Kutuk Janik to Shakin Martins. As you need to live for Kuludirnas, Lorna Salam, Sherko Salam, Hadish Ede Dech Fikit. Reading in the Book of Psalms, Psalm 147. From verse 12 to the end, on Darne Ker Diuk Gotidigudulem. Molug and Yearn a Israel, Molug to Yea a Heon, or Nurse the Kakreen to Gehtuchen, Venicatochlaund and the Vestuyot, Neashi at Riochen, Sazke a Lesmir a Hrinach, Kudiamach Anya et Halof, Guluria, Achkel, Vedeashnach Mar Olin. Skuli and Dierog Marluade, Tiliki a mach ev mar Grimonen, Coagut a schisophon at Uok, Quidi a mach achkel, Agaslea eat, Shetty a goog, Sruin a huskuchen, Failchike achkel to Jacob, Arachken agasadehanus to Israel, Hatavune Marsha, the Kinnerson be, Havon a panagaev. If they had nish, Mollus and Dierne. Amen, Scoradierne Penachuin, if we live with Hirn Shagachel. Well, Joe, didn't that sound great? Neil reading Psalm 147 in the Gaelic. I'm not sure why, because I don't speak a word of Gaelic, but I love the sound of it. It has an almost spiritual quality to it. Do you find that? <clears throat> Absolutely, Martin. And, and just to hear, to hear the Bible read in it with the music of another language and, and to know that that is a language of our own land here and all that connection with the, the land and the words and, and the poetry of it. Mm. And, and just to just to soak that up, even though you don't you don't know each word. Yeah, it's an experience, a good experience. I love how you described the, the music of the language and, uh, and it has got that about it for sure. Now, as I said, Neil was reading uh, the final parts of Psalm 147. And Joe, I, I know you've reflected on that Psalm. Um, would you want to share a wee bit about what you find in these verses? Mm. Well, first of all, Martin, I think what apt verses for winter days and the snow, frost, hail, cold, wind, and God being in charge of them all. And it's a psalm that takes us back to times probably before the exile with Jerusalem and her people, the beneficiaries of God's, God's protecting and blessing and feeding and peace building. And there's a tender note in there too being sounded with the mention of the children, the little ones in society. In contrast to Jeremiah, whose words we often we also hear today, words that were rejected, but here the word of God revealed to Israel is regarded as a gift solely for her. Israel alone among the nations knows God's laws and instructions. 
And this is seen as reason for praise. And there's no edge of pomposity or superiority there. So I see the sentiments of the whole psalm, as well as these closing verses, conveying a sense of peacetime and relative security. There's a call to praise being addressed to the people, and the psalmist calls up many good reasons for that praise. And twice, he speaks of God's words going out like a swift runner and able to melt hailstones. I think these are superb physical images, as we say, the word made flesh, as good poetry does it best. So it makes me think, what calls forth our praise at this year's beginning? Which of God's laws or commandments are feeling like a blessing to us today? We might even take time this week to write in our own words, maybe a short poem depicting God's word going out. What is it like? How does it behave? What poetry describes the effect God's word has on us? Wow. Thanks, Joe, for just finding such wonder uh, in these lines and inviting us uh, all the more into them, uh, that we might appropriate them and, and take them into the year with us. Thank you for that, Joe. And might I just wish you every blessing uh, on your work with Wild Goose and everything you do in this coming year. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Martin, and to you. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Our thanks be to God. A quick Google tells us that Epiphany falls on the 6th of January, Wednesday. And the same search suggests that Epiphany is one of the three great Christian festivals. I'm not sure what that says about Pentecost, which for me should be way up the top of the list, but we shouldn't rush past Epiphany without at least pausing to reflect on what it might say to us. Of course, in specific terms, Epiphany celebrates the coming of the Magi, the wise men, and therefore through them, the manifestation of Christ to the whole world. Now, most scholars agree that the visit of the Magi was some time after the actual birth of Christ. So maybe it's no bad thing that we have Epiphany a little after Christmas Day itself. But the word Epiphany takes us further than that specific happening. The Cambridge Dictionary defines Epiphany as a moment when you suddenly feel that you understand or suddenly become conscious of something that is very 
important to you. Well, I'm someone who doesn't struggle to let my imagination run. I think in terms of epiphany, lots, therefore, whether up on the hills or walking along the beach, there are moments when the sun bursts through thick cloud. And it always feels to me like something of an epiphany, a revelation, a demonstration, and certainly a moment when I become conscious of something that is very important to me. What is that? Nothing less than God. And that God is here. And yes, that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Of course, this gets to the very nature of who God is. <coughs> From the beginning, God has been in the business of making himself known. The creation itself is the outworking of the truth that God said, that God spoke, and there was something rather than nothing. We call it revelation, the sense in which God is made known. Listen, there are certainly times when there is a seeming silence from the heavens. In Isaiah, we find the Lord asking, was I not silent for a long time? And in Samuel, we read, in those days, the word of the Lord was very rare. Maybe you've known something of that silence. Maybe you've felt your prayers to be bouncing back at you unanswered. Maybe you've been in anguish, wrestling with who you are and why you're here and what's the point, and maybe you've sensed no answer to these deeper questions. Maybe in these last nine months, maybe right now, you're asking, well, where is God in all of this? It's okay if you're asking these questions. Absolutely, sometimes the silence is deafening. But the big picture is of revelation, of the voice of God going out. And how is it heard? Through what means is the voice of God discerned? By what means does God reveal God's being and nature and character and purpose? Well, first of all, in what God has made. The psalmist writes, The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. So the creation itself reveals something of who God is. And Paul writes that, what may be known about God is plain because God has made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made. So friends, there is something of God's unveiling in the mountain and in the ocean and in the stars at night and in the desert and in the forest and in the birds and the beasts. Everything that God has made speaks of God. Secondly, God has put something of the divine spark, something of God's self, in each one of us, that we might know him. There's a leaning in that direction, if you like, something of the law written on every heart. The writer of Ecclesiastes puts it beautifully. He has planted eternity in the human heart. Isn't that a lovely, powerful sentiment? Something of God's eternity on our hearts. And God reveals more of the divine nature through anointed prophets, tasked with saying, thus says the Lord. The apostle Peter writes, we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, like a light shining in a dark place. 
all that we might know God, all that we might see, all that we might become conscious, all that we might find ourselves singing, be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. And yes, finding ourselves seeing the glory of the Lord shining all around. This is epiphany. This is God revealing who God is. But supremely, most of all, God makes himself known in Jesus. Jesus is the complete revelation. Nothing needed adding or subtracting. In the wonderful prologue to his gospel, John tells us that no one has ever seen God, but that the Son, that is Jesus, has made him known. In Colossians, Paul says much the same by declaring Jesus to be the image of the invisible God. And in Hebrews, the same truth that Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Jesus, the exact imprint of God's very being. Which is all to say that God wants to be known. That in Jesus we can say, we have seen the Father. I've shared this story before of when our middle son Andrew was just a wee boy, maybe about three. We were on a car journey coming home one day and he asked us completely out of the blue, what colour is God? Well, I might be the minister, but my wife's a primary teacher. So I said to Elaine, you can answer that one. And she did. She said, Andrew, God can be whatever colour you want him to be. That's a fine enough answer. But if Andrew had asked, what's God like? She wouldn't have answered so lackadaisically. You see, we're not left just to make it up for ourselves. The answer what God to the question what God is like is in Jesus. When we see Jesus, we see what God is like. Jesus is the perfect representation of who God is. You want to know what God is like? Look to Jesus. Remember the dictionary definition of epiphany? A moment when you suddenly feel that you understand or suddenly become conscious of something that is very important to you. There is that moment when seeing Jesus, we suddenly feel that we've understood, perhaps because we have understood. And when we suddenly become conscious of that which is important. This is what happens when we see Jesus, the boy born at Bethlehem, the lad in the temple with the teachers of the law, the young rabbi calling the fisherman, the preacher, the teacher, the prophet, the healer, the comforter and the confronter, the turner of tables, the friend of sinners, the giver of sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, peace to the troubled minds. The one who would say, so you say, to those in power and authority. The one who went silently. The one who bore the nails and the crown of thorns. The one who bled and died and gave up his spirit and breathed his last and declared, it is finished. And yes, the one whom God raised from the dead to ascend and to reign forever. This Jesus. And in this Jesus, God is made known. The Magi were the first from afar who draw near and saw for themselves. What about you? Would you gaze on Jesus as they did? 
would you see for yourself? And at the start of this new year, is there anything that you would wish for more than a revelation of the divine? Jesus has come. Jesus is here that we might know the Father. Amen. Eternal God, as we come to a new year and wonder about the meaning of time, we pray that you would be with us as we travel with one another in these strange lockdown days. As we do, so we ask for a heart of wisdom. As we reflect upon all the endless possibilities of creation, we're overwhelmed that you gently called each one of us into being, that we were known to you before our birth, that you gave us a name, that you made us all in our own uniqueness. We give thanks for your word made flesh among us. Eternal God, bless your church, that it may grow in love for you, that it may grow holiness, that it may grow in these lockdown days. And we remember before you all who reach out in mission to tell of your love and your saving power. Eternal God, darkness covers the earth and its people, but the radiance of your light burns away its shadows, illuminates the smallest corner and heralds in the start of a new dawn, where hearts no longer fear, where souls might be set free, and sister shall follow brother, nation shall follow nation, and kings and princes bow down in awe before the one who comes to reign. We pray for our communities, that snapshot of humanity with all ages, backgrounds, education, politics and religious viewpoints, who are our neighbours in the streets where we live. And we pray for all of them, not only those we know by name and chat to through the day, but also familiar faces about whom we know so little and pass by with just a smile, all in need of your love at this time. Bless their homes and their families and let your love and peace so shine within our communities that smiles turn to conversations and strangers become friends. We pray this through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen.
Friends, it's been good to worship with you today. I hope you have been blessed by our time together, perhaps challenged, perhaps comforted. Either way, know that God will go with us. We'll finish the service with the benediction and I've turned again to Neil, our elder friend from Stornoway, to lead the benediction. Amen.